Bill Gross, the LA probate expert, and this is our probateweekly.com call, where we get together every Thursday at four o'clock to talk about all things probate. Um, oh, look at that. Oh, we, got another... we got we got Zoom bombed again. Wow, wow. You know, somebody posted my uh, Zoom link in Twitter. And on Tuesday, I got nonstop Zoom bombed, and I don't even know why they do that. Um, but um, uh, if I don't recognize your name, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to anybody in. Just don't let anybody in uh, at this point. We've got 33 people. We'll just go with what we have at this point, unless I recognize the name. Um, but they're going to try to come back in again. So anyhow, Bill Gross, probateweekly.com. Yeah, they're going to ship it directly to here. I'm sorry? He's just... Uh, uh, mute and remove. Um, <laughs> probateweekly.com. We'll get to you every Thursday, 4 o'clock, to about all things probate. I wanted to share with you guys, um, first of all, I had done a um, survey for um, uh, those people who've come to the program in the past. And as a result, I have the results of that. And this is who's on the call and why I ask the questions I do and the topics I do. What I want to say is, when I started this, my initial... Uh, plan. Hey, uh, Jess, if you want to compare the people waiting room to registrant list, if you reg if they registered, let them in. Otherwise, we're going to leave them on hold today. Okay. So anyhow, I started this by my goal. I'm a practitioner. I'm not selling any coaching. I'm not selling any data or services. Uh, I'm really looking to build my business by interviewing attorneys and and find other agents to work with and investors, wholesalers to work with and and practitioners. Um, and uh, and it's been great. It's my business exploded as a result of that. Yeah, I do have an affiliate relationship with Probate Mastery, and we'll talk about that at the end. But my real goal here is just to help people and then for me to find other practitioners who are in the business to work with and share what's working, what's not working, how to be better at our, at our craft to give better service and obviously make more business and more money in the long run. So along the way, I did a survey of the people who are on this call. So I just want to share with you kind of the findings there, and I'll tell you about what we're going to do going forward. So you guys can see this. The first question I asked was, are you actively involved in doing lead generation and probate? And really only 31%, of a third of you said yes, two thirds are no. And I think two thirds of you as a general rule are thinking of getting into it or getting ready to get into it, but not actively. And only a third actually are. Then when I asked the next question, where do you get your data from? And again, about 60% said none. And some of you had other sources. So what happens is some of you have signed up for data uh, programs and haven't made any phone calls yet or done any marketing activities. That's another common problem. It's a waste of money, in my opinion. I don't want you guys to spend money if you're not going to get value for it. Then I asked, do you have a coach in probate specifically? And, and most say no. There's a couple of people, um, Chad Corbett, my coach, Kevin Sales, one of my coaches, Bruce Hill, like the guy a lot, allweeds.com, Mike Torres, I took his program. Dave Pennell launched a program, very good guy. Sharon, I had on this call, and uh, Ernie Vargas does probate Fox smaller percentage, but most of you don't have a coach at all. And I would say that it doesn't mean you need to have a coach all the time, but you need to be, I think, constantly learning and growing and having somebody ahead of you that you're looking towards building your business. Uh, and I'm glad to be that person for free. Um, how long have you been in the business? Um, about half of you were over five years, which I found interesting. Because to me, if you've been in business five years, you've probably come across a probate deal or two. Uh, and then that's what we talk about today is how to build that business. And then a uh, quarter of you are brand new or not started yet. And about another third of you are one to five years. How long lead generating and probate? Again, three quarters, zero to just started. And then about a quarter of you, either a year or over five years. And then when I ask what you're interested in, um, vendors that help you do the job was one. Agents having success. I interviewed Paul Cook a couple of weeks ago, and I'm still looking for more. Hard to get agents to talk about it. I have to tell you, uh, I've called and I've, and I've reached out in various states in Atlanta, Florida. I have a team in Atlanta now. I'm looking to build a team in Florida and New York. But I'm not necessarily recruiting them. I'm just looking to interview them. If you know a real estate agent that does probate and has had success that you think would like to share their, their success story nationally outside California, I'd love to interview them. So that's, that's, those are the questions I ask. And so as a result of that, my goal was really more to talk to practitioners who are in the business. I'm not, I don't want to sell you on getting into probate. I've been doing it. If you're committed, jump in, love to help you. 
But today I thought just uh, in the next few weeks that I've, because of the survey, I've lined up a number of attorneys and agents so that we can talk about that for those of us who are the practitioners and be more successful. In the meantime, what I'll say is that um, I'd like to talk today a bit about what happens if you're brand new in real estate and you want to build your business and the way you want to start it is in probate. And what I would say to you is instead of spending a lot of money through, which would mean maybe buying data and mailing postcards, I'm really big on reinvesting your money. Most people start in real estate as salespeople don't have excess money or they'd be investors. You start out as a new wholesaler, a new investor, typically, or an agent, you don't have extra cash. We have time. So I'm going to share with you the, the right steps for somebody who's starting to build a probate business as they're building their real estate business in the beginning, not an established agent. So what, is, what are the steps you would take? And I cover a lot of these steps in detail on my YouTube channel, which is Bill Gross EXP. And I also would say that if you have enough money to get coaching, I recommend Chad Corbett, who's my coach. I participate in that program. I coach, I've substituted on his, on his podcast, and I'm there regularly. So if you're interested in that program, I'll have a, a link down below. We'll love to have you join in with us on that program. But you're welcome to come here every week. I'd love to help you. And you're also welcome to call me to reach out with problems or questions. But how do you start a real estate business? So your two options are you can buy data and pay to mail out. That's an option. If you have the money, in my experience, uh, in competitive markets, you're going to have to have a program of mailing your leads for two years and probably monthly you know, in the beginning and then maybe every 90 days. You're probably talking six to eight to 10 uh, contacts, letters per lead. And so you can imagine that if, you, if it takes you, say, a couple hundred to get your first deal, that you're talking about investing thousands of dollars. That's an option. The other option we talk about today is building your network which is the same thing you need to do to be successful in real estate anyhow. Now, I want to say, anybody has a question anytime, raise your hand on the um, reactions in Zoom if you're live, or put in the chat box question or put your question there. Or if you're on live, unmute yourself, jump in. I'd be glad to answer questions as we go along. The goal here is to be as interactive as possible. The more interactive it is, the more everybody learns and succeeds. And I'll just tell you, the more you participate, you're helping everybody else. So, but I'm going to go through a list of things here, and I want you to jump in when you have questions. Number one, you have to build your foundation database. You have to build your foundation database. There's no way around real estate without having a sales funnel where you keep all the contacts that you market to, no matter what you do. And I don't care if you're a state-of-the-art technologist, they have a sales funnel. And they might have a CRM or a sales funnel or list or whatever you want to call it. You have to build that list. And that list in real estate. Now, if you want to compete with the Zillows and the Googles, you could probably do it all on social media or electronically. If you want a competitive advantage against them, you want to interact as a human being, which Google and Facebook can't do. So what does that mean? So number one, your foundation database for every contact, everybody that you know, and we want to use the following standards that they know, like, and trust you, and you know, like, and trust them. So no is a little different in the, in the times of COVID because so many of us have been locked in. I would say that knowing means you've at least had a one-on-one -on -one Zoom with them, or maybe you're on a call with a breakout and you met them one-on-one -on -one and talked a little in depth one-on-one, -on -one, or met in person, either one of those. Normally I would say in person. And I would say that you know, like, and trust them, and they know, like, and trust you. If you bumped into them at Target or Ralph's, they'd say hello to you. If you call them on the phone, they wouldn't avoid your phone call. They might be sending everything to voicemail at that time, but they're not avoiding you. They don't look at you as a salesperson. They look at you as somebody they know, like, and trust. Every one of those for the rest of your real estate business needs to go into your foundational system, your sales funnel, your CRM. If you're Keller Williams agent, you're Mets. Whatever you want to call it, they all need to go into your database. If you're an XP agent like me, into your KV court. Every single one. Now, the goal is to have what I call complete contact with those people, which is name, phone number, email address, and a connection for social media. Name, obviously. Phone number, obviously, to text. Email, obviously. But people have multiple emails. And social media means you need to be able to reach out to them, to contact them, on the platform that they're on. 
So if you say to me, well, Bill, I'm very hip and cool, I'm only on TikTok, I'm gonna say you're probably missing about half your prospects because while it's great, and if you can really work TikTok well, maybe that works for you, but for most people, half the people you meet are not on TikTok. Maybe they will be, I don't know. But you gotta go where people are. And also people operate usually on one platform the most. When they say DM me, right? They mean Facebook messaging, or they mean Instagram messaging. You have to be on the platform, or they mean WhatsApp messaging. So you have to have a way to connect with them in order to be effective. And that's the social media. So whatever your, so whatever your program is, like if it's Facebook, you would go through the list of those people that you're not yet connected with and make sure you try to reach out to them and connect in whichever format you're in, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever format you use. So your goal then is to, ident- is to put all four now, not many are complete. Most people in my experience know about 100 people. And if you're married, that's about 200 people, just to start with. If you've been in business, you have another list of people. You have past clients, contacts, employees, former employers. All those are people that you know, like, and meet, and trust, and such. If you're a real estate agent, title rep, mortgage rep, teachers, class teachers. That's your foundation. That's the database. The next thing is, what do you do with it? So what you do with it is, you... The, you contact each of those four processes. You phone people at least every 90 days. Everybody you meet for the rest of your career, if you're a new agent, you call them every 90 days. And when I say contact them, that means attempt to call them three times. Hang up before the fourth ring, attempt one, attempt two, and only leave a message on the third ring. Maybe a text message. Hey, Jeff, Bill Gross, I just re- reach out to you. See how you're doing. Let me know if I can help in any way. Uh, Jasmine, what's wrong with people? You're right. You're so right. Um, so that's the phone calling. Emailing them something every week. Emailing them something every week. I email everybody I've ever met in my database. It's now about 2,700 people. And I say met, using that criteria. I don't include real estate agents because well, some are competitors and such. So, but every consumer, every vendor, every non realtor, and a lot of the realtors I work with as well. My key, there's a key criteria I use for that. But I email something every single Monday morning at 6 a.m. In fact, it's a video linked to an email every single week. I've done that. I did the email for years, and I added the video a few months ago. And what I'll say is that I have people who I haven't seen in, a, in 10 years tell me, I get your email every week. Because even though I open it, they see the title of it. They see the, you know, the subject line go by. That's as good as the, sending them something they open in many cases. So you email, you'll call every 90 days, you'll email them weekly, and then snail mail. Now, this costs money. Most of you don't have an extra money. So I would recommend only sending mail to those you have their mailing address, and you've talked to them on the phone, and you have their email address, and you're connecting social media to save money. Meaning out of your 100, 200, you might only have 30 that meet that criteria, but those are your core 30. I would postcard them and save some money because a postcard's gonna cost about 50 cents to a buck a piece. So 30 is 30 bucks rather than 200 at $200 if you do it every couple months. That's snail mail. And then social media, you need to post regularly. You probably can't post too much if it's a value. So what you don't wanna do is post stuff the company to say, oh, we'll give you content every week. Don't do that, it's impersonal. You need to post something that you find interesting and is about you. So for me, I talk about the real estate market. I focus in LA. I talk about probate. I I live stream these things. I clip them down into pieces. And I post things that I find of interest to my client database. I would never have somebody post social media something for me. They might, they might, when I write up the post, post it on, on YouTube or something, but I create the description and the title myself. That's essentially my communication with my clients. That can't be delegated. That's me as a person. And I know that a lot of people hire social media people. Over time, your team members can learn your style and your voice, but that's down the road. If you're starting the business, you have to do that yourself. So I would say social media as much of you as you can. You touring property, you going to escrow, you picking up a check, you dropping off a check, you driving by comps. You seeing a funny house, you seeing a sad house. If you're new in the business, 
about you and about real estate and about your market area. I love the concept of an agent adopting a small market area and being an expert in it. I talked to an agent yesterday about Gardena, small city, but great. You can hit every restaurant in Gardena pretty quickly. Every little business in Gardena start working on the bigger businesses, right? So it shouldn't be a big city. It shouldn't be all Los Angeles unless you're a big agent. So that's how we contact. So as a real estate agent for free, if you want, the first activities are building that foundation or database or CRM, and then you're going to contact them and fill in those blanks. Now you would say, well, what am I going to contact them about? So here's the scripts. On the phone, when you call friends, family, vendors you meet, the script is this. Hey, it's Bill Gross. Dwayne, how are you doing? You know, I just make sure you know I'm in real estate. I started uh, two years ago, a year ago, six months ago. I started to open a real estate business. I'm on a huge team of 77,000 agents nationwide. But I want you to know, I'm your real estate. I want to be your real estate resource. From your front sidewalk to the back fence, anything real estate, on my team, we have experts in all those fields. If it's a tree that falls over, a question regarding your property, I want you to call me and let me help you by being your resource. Does that sound fair? Who's going to say no to that? Sounds fair, yes. Appreciate you calling. Right. Anybody's going to say that. So, um, okay, hold on. I got a question here. Okay, I'll get to that question, Oscar, in a bit. And Jasmine asked me, do you find more success with SM posts, social media posting, or with email campaigns? I just felt that uh, people skip over emails if they're not instantly engaged and have a great subject line. Jasmine, I would say that um, social media posts are both for people I know and don't know. I'm trying to grab people in. Email are only people I have a connection with at some level for the most part. Uh, but I definitely want to email people who know me, like me, and trust me every single week. And more than that, actually. So I do both. I send a lot of email. Okay, so we go back. That's the script. I want to be your resource. Because I, and this is the big mistake. When you're a top agent making a million dollars a year, running a team, of course you don't want people calling you about your tree trunk. But when you're an agent below that, I make you know half of that. But I want my clients to call me when they have a question about the tree problem or squatters or property taxes. I want them calling me about anything to do with real estate so I can solve the problem by either answering it or connecting with somebody that can answer it for them. You know, I, I think I should have a probate where we had to uh, trash out um, uh, estate sale, firearms dealer, illegal firearms removal, uh, moving out equipment, getting storage, uh, getting the squatter out, uh, re rekeying the place, removing a wall, a uh, fence, nine different things we had to do. They were all problems. Of course, we want to solve the problem for the client. That's our job. But every time a client calls you with a problem, that's your chance to show how important you are, how valuable you are to them. So don't look at that as something to avoid. That's the business. Now, I'll get to what you do with that. But hold the thought. If you're saying to me, well, that sounds like a lot of work. It is, but that's the work that pays off. And hold on to that thought. Email is your message. Is, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help guide you through the marketplace. I'm here to help you with different vendors I work with. You can take a video of yourself with different vendors. And your social media post is, what, what problem am I solving for my client? Like today, most of my clients who are sellers are wondering where the market is because I still sell my house. And I want to show them, yeah, I can help you negotiate that process. Now, when you call your database, your foundation, your CRM, your METS, whatever you call it, you want to fill in the vendor list. And remember, we start off with, how can you build your business? You don't need to buy data. We're going to, start, we're going to start with the people you know already. So when you call somebody, you want to make sure you know what they do for work. Right? Imagine if you have a client you didn't know. You sold them a house. You showed them a house. And they didn't buy from you. And you call them back. Hey, Joe, you know, I know we met an open house six months ago. You didn't buy. I kind of lost track of you. I just want to call and reintroduce myself to you. Hey, I'm curious. I never really put down on my data. Is what do you do for work? And it turns out he works at an escrow company or a title company. Or he works at a tree trimming company. Or he works at a painting contractor. You want to know that. Well, tell me more about that. What kind of contract do you guys do? Well, if he says he paints, you know, huge commercial buildings, that might not be as effective. But if they do residential houses, would that be a good contact to know or not? All right? So you want to know what they do. You want to know what the spouse does. Hey, I forgot to ask, are you married? Oh, yeah, what's your name? Fantastic. How long is married? Oh, wow. Okay. People love talking about themselves. True or false? We love to, you have kids, they love talking about their kids. 
not talking about grandkids. Make notes, put it in your database. But ask what the spouse does, because you might find out the spouse, you know, it's interesting. My, my uh, daughter got a job for my son-in-law because one of her girlfriends asked about a CPA. I mean, my husband's a CPA. Uh, she was looking for somebody to hire for their company. Turns out he got like a dream job at a huge wealth management company just because a friend asked a friend about what they did for a living, right? So you wonder what the spouse does. And here's the thing. Ask about the vendor that you get asked the most about. So imagine if you're doing, I would imagine if you're doing residential real estate, the, the well, let me ask, what's the vendor you get asked the most about? For those of you been in real estate, what's the one you get called on and asked about the most? So maybe you have, maybe you don't, but you get asked it all the time. Anybody in particular? Put in the chat box. Any particular vendor, any particular service, any particular problem that people call about painters? Okay, there's one. Stagers. Stagers are when you have the listing. Videographers when you have the listing. I'm talking about before they want to sell the house. Michelle. B, wasp removal. Yeah. Who else? As a real estate agent, you have a past client, not the new agents, but the experienced agents. What kind of, what do people call you for? Say, hey, can you help me? I have a problem with my house. Remodel. There you go. If I could rephrase that one, at least a contractor. Inspectors, again, is probably more when they want to sell. I'm talking about before they want to sell the house before they know they want to sell, right? So those are good. I would say, uh, um, for me, it's handyman. I get asked that all the time. But painters is another one. That was a good answer, too, I think. Um, plumbing, electrical, handyman. Exactly, Lisa. Exactly. So while you're calling your database, and let's say he works for Google and she works for uh, Facebook, you might say, I'm just curious if they own a house. Do you guys have a good handyman you recommend? Would it be nice to add to your database good handyman? They might say no. I'm always looking for good handyman for my clients. What does that say? If I said that to you, Elizabeth Hernandez, if I said to you, uh, you know, I asked you, do you know a good handyman? I'm the manager, I'm the realtor, you're the homeowner. You know, and if you don't have a good handyman, what does my asking you say about me? Gardener, good foundation card. I'm sorry. You value um, their opinion. Value their opinion, you're good. What else? What's your reaction, Elizabeth? If I said to you, I'm curious, do you guys, I know you guys own a house. Do you have a handyman that you recommend? Or anybody else? What does it say yes, about most? I do have handyman that I recommend. And always, um, as I mentioned before, I always recommend two, um, two handymen. And for them to contact the, the clients or leads or whoever, prospect, whoever required. Um, right. The reason but why, because... Uh, I always think about liability. Yes, I do. Um, well, no, but my question is, if you were a homeowner and I asked you that question, do you know a handyman that I could recommend to my clients? Oh. How is your client, what are they going to think about you when you ask them that question? Well, they, if you as a realtor, me as a yeah. client? Yeah, you know, well, I, I will think, always, always I will think that it will be, my realtor will be better resourceful and helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I will be feel please and always recommend yeah. it forward. Yeah. See, a lot of you who are new are afraid that your cousins own a house, your family members own a house, your friends own a house, whatever, because you're new, they're, they're going to think that you're not very good. You can show them how good you are by calling them and say, hey, I haven't talked to you in a while. I just make sure you know I'm in real estate. You know, I'm always looking for a good handyman. Do you know anybody that you would recommend to my clients? What are they going to think about that? They're going to think you are Resourceful, just like Elizabeth said, you are on the job. You are doing your job on a regular basis, trying to help your clients. So you want to call them and ask them for their, for the vendor that you get asked for the most, painter, whatever it is for you. So again, that's your script. I gave you that. You call them and ask them about what they do, what the spouse does, if they have one, and the one vendor that you ask the most. Then, again, this is for the brand new agents to build their business. Then you call a vendor. Now think about this for a second. I call a vendor and say, hey, Joe, um, I don't know who wants to role play with me, but uh, hey, I, I was talking to Elizabeth Hernandez. She mentioned that you are a great handyman, and uh, I see your phone number is the 562. Um, what area do you service, and are you looking for more business? Some will say, no, I'm retired. Some will say, yeah, I love it. I'm in wherever, South Amani. Yeah, call me. What's your phone number? Great. What's your email address? Do you have a website? Fantastic. 
you know, get reviews on Yelp or that kind of thing. No, you know, I'm going to send a link to Elizabeth for her to give you a review for you because she speaks highly of you. Maybe she doesn't know how important Yelp is to your business. If I made that phone call to you as a handyman, what are you going to think about me? Right? And our goal is to meet them. So either in person, get on a Zoom call with them maybe, or whatever format you use, FaceTime. You also might, uh, so you're going to introduce them. You're going to get their info. You're going to try to do a one-on-one with them. You could record the video. Imagine you could say, you know, by the way, I know you're handyman. I'd love to just record a few minutes with you in interview so that when people ask you for handyman, I can send them a link to our video. Would that be okay with you? I do this all the time. I just did two today with attorneys all the time. Not everybody loves it. Half will say yes, half will say no. That's okay. I got you recorded today. Then you can also invite them to an event that they would benefit from. So, for example, the, I mentioned you guys often the um, Vendor Expo with Larrick, LA Real Estate Investment Club. Great event to invite vendors to come to either as a vendor booth or just come see it and meet people to develop business. It's a great place to develop business. So, so now you call the vendors, you meet them, you add them in your database. Now you can cold call homeowners, you can door knock homeowners. Those are great, but most people won't do it. Or you can call vendors that your friends and family recommend to you and seek to build them into your business. Now, a lot of more easier said than done. You'll call some companies and there's a secretary and they're not gonna get you through to the owner and that's okay. The goal is to get in a conversation with the person. So you talk to her, the person on the phone, gosh, you sound really on top of your game. I'm curious how long you've been with this company. Oh, wow. And what do you do? Are you just are you in the office or do you also go out in the field? Engage with that person. Your goal is to meet them. They're all human beings. Here's what I'll tell you. If you spend three or four hours a day networking with the people in your database, getting those referrals, and then calling those people they introduce you to and add them in your database as well and do the, the systems I talked about, you'll have more business than you ever imagined. You won't get through the whole list. I've never gotten through my whole list because I started doing this. And I don't know, through the, the Ds, I can tell you who the name was, through the Ds, I just got caught up with referrals. And today, pretty much my business is people calling me with questions and getting into my calendar, uh, as well as my live streaming. Because I always look to give first, then get. And here's the key point I want to say to you guys about real estate. There's an ancient, there's an ancient um, teaching that says the people fit in. Just one second, I'm gonna get this off. Where am I? Uh, there we go. There's an ancient teaching that says that you can divide people into two, one of two groups: either givers or takers. The people who really struggle in real estate are at their core takers. They're looking for a way they can do something that gives them business. When we all meet those people, you feel it. You feel a little slimy when you talk to them. Me as a realtor, I talk to more people all the time, and I offer to have them come on my other real estate investing call. And really, the more, most mortgage lenders, 90%, the takers, will say, well, can't you just refer me to your customers? Well, of course I could, but what are you doing to help build our business together? And one in 10 will say, let's do something together. Here's what I do. I call the guy who's a giver. He said, well, I don't want to really come on the call. It's just not my jam. But here's what we can do together to build our business together. And he's been an asset for me. So what I say to you is when you come from helping other people, when you come from giving in the relationship, when you come from educating people and helping them first, you'll have more business than you have know what to do with. And that's what this process is all about. Now, I've talked a lot for 31 minutes, a little longer than to. Let me go through. I know we have some questions I missed over in the beginning. I'm going to come back to you. If you have a question, Feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself as well. So Oscar asked a straight on uh, probate question. How do you find when a court date scheduled for confirming when the listing agent does not disclose the MLS? Well, the agent is supposed to disclose those activities if there is a confirmation sale date set. Most don't. Many of them don't even know the answer. So Oscar, what I'd say is if it's in LA County, reach out to me. I'd be glad to help you. Get the case number if you have it. If not, give me the property address. They'll have the last name of the decedent, which is the estate. I'll look it up for you, and I can help you with that as well. Okay? Uh, uh, Bill, uh, Bill. Yes. Uh, yeah, this Oscar. Yeah, no, I, I, I really appreciate that. But, yeah, I, um, the reason I asked that question is uh, a lot of agents, um, they will yes. not list it, even though if you call them up. Yes. I don't know whether they, yes. they know. 
that they're yes. supposed to disclose it or they're just trying to double in, which I have no problem with. But uh, but uh, yeah, I ha- you know, it's not like that. I have the, the 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 case number or anything like that. I was just wondering, you know, how could you <clears throat> how could you do that without a case number? Because a lot of these agents, they won't list it or they don't know they're right. supposed to list it, you right. know. So well, you can look it up if you have the property address. I can look up based on the property address who the decedent was. And from the scene, I can figure out who the case number is. So okay. if it's in, in Southern California, call me or text me, and I'd be glad to help you and walk you through that. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. But you're right. What, what he's saying is that they're listing agents who, despite their legal obligation to market the property, attempt to not market the property. Right. I, I specialize. Of the 11 ways to make a sale in real estate, that's the one I specialize in, is really digging deep and uncovering those opportunities for my clients. And it makes me sometimes not the best friends with, some of those, um, some of those listing agents, but that's not my job. My job is to take care of my client. My job is also to service their client, even though they're not doing that because we're real estate agents and that's our obligation to the industry. So it is, there's a lot of shenanigans that go on and, and Oscar, you're right on point. There's less than there used to be. And I think there's some of the old timers that still act that way. So again, if it's in Southern California in particular, reach out to me, I'll be glad to help you try to unwind it. If it's a court confirmation sale, I'll be glad to try to help you partner on the deal. Maybe we can do something together. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah. Um, so that was that question. And then um, do I find my success with social media? I think we talked about that or email campaigns. Um, it's important to be an overall resource. Yeah, yes, it's true. You want to be their real estate resource. That's your goal. You want, when they have any questions regarding resource, a, re- a real estate, you're the person that they call. Um, Oh, somebody else suggested cleaning lady. Man, that is the truth. Cleaning ladies, who you'll be some best friends with some women if you can come up with a connection. Now, I've used in the past Molly Maids as a contractor, and they do a really good job. They're not that personal, but they consistently will get the job done for me as an agent on cleaning up houses. Like I list, I'll list a house, we'll trash it out, and then we'll send Molly Maids in to clean up afterwards. Uh, Dwayne, you asked about blogging. You mean as far as a, a vendor for clients blogging? Oh, blogging for it as a uh, um, blogging as far as uh, marketing to your client database. Uh, in you know, general, it just yeah, you know, so, uh, that's the sub blogging is a subject. Not sure how you might be applying it or using. I'm curious. Right. So, you know, there's you know uh, there's blogging and there's you know I think that to some regard YouTube is a video blog, right? If you think about it. Uh, so I do post all my videos everywhere I can. Um, for example, Google My Business has a, you have a business page. And so I post my emails and my video on the Google page. And I get views on my Google page as a result. And now my ranking on my Google has gone up and people are calling me off of Google search, which I never had before. I'm not really, that's not really my business. I'm not really a retail agent in Beverly Hills, but all of a sudden, if you, you know, research my area, I, I pop up much higher because of the posting. So that's what I call repurposing. I would blog it. Writing out long form text, I just find most people, I write an email and I record the video of that email and send it out. And some people read and some people see the video. So when you do a vlog, you know, a blog, in the old days, you would blog and hope people get to it. Nowadays, you want to email them, you want to capture their email address so you can email them content. I know personally, I'd rather just read the email than have to click and go to a blog and then see it there. Um, is my preference. It's up to you, I guess. It depends on, look, your clients are going to do what you think is best and my clients going to do what I think is best. And that's why we don't really compete, right? I, I think that um, I was thinking of it, and this is just new to me recently, but just thinking of it as far as having it posted on a website, your website, mm-hmm. my website, what have you. Lisa not not asked, that I'm sending it out, but just that I have a blog, that I would have a blog on my website covering various subjects. So just curious. Well, I think it's it's good, it, but how do you get people to read it? That, well, the, you know, in, in short, there's magical words, shall we say, for lack of terminology, that uh, draw people in, and there's research to do that. It's it can be intensive. I'm only in the yeah. beginnings of it now. Yeah, I mean, there's there's SEO, search engine optimization, where you kind of compete with certain words to get people who are searching to find your content. What we find now is more and more in Google that the, the search that people look for goes to video more and more. They find that more engaging because it keeps, they're in the business. You know, Google used to be about 
getting you information, the best information. Now they're a business. They're just purely an advertising arm. And they, and they want to keep you on their properties. And so they find that with the search result is a video that you're going to watch for five minutes. They'd rather you go there than to a blog that you're going to read. So that's why the videos become so important in marketing. I think a blog is great, but I would say to you, when you're done blog, writing the blog post, record it as video and post that somewhere and you can link back to it and double your, your time spent. Because the hard work is the content. Um, videoing, it's not really that hard. People have different personal issues, but it's not really that hard. I My uh, EXP sponsor lady, who's based out of Sarasota, mm -hmm. uh, she had big success with that and she's teaching mm -hmm. a few of us what she's learned as well. So I'm new she's, to it. Go she's ahead. doing video or she's teaching blogging? Uh, blogging and uh, I think she probably uh, probably mixes in some video for illustration, you know, maybe short video there. I'm only in the beginnings now, so I don't have too many answers. Who's that? Who's the coach? Uh, she is uh, the late. She sponsored me. Her name is Sandy Williams. Okay. Sarah, Sandy, Sarasota Sandy. She's you know, in Florida. Got it. Fun, wonderful lady. And she sponsored me in about three and a half years ago. Nice. Okay. Well, I, I can't speak to her. I would say that um, blog, anything you do is great. It's just more is better. And so blogging is great. If you can then take the content and record a video and post that better, put it in multiple channels, better yet. I think uh, that's called repurposing your content. Lisa says, any chance we can chat about scripts when reaching out to attorneys? So of the 11 ways to get business, I talked about one of them, attorney referrals. That's about an hour long that I did on that. I'm glad to chat about it. Um, and toward, towards that, I have coming on guests to the show in the future, um, in the next few weeks. Where are we here? Um, on February 3rd, next week, one of the top attorneys from Florida probate, Al Nicoletti. Um, that on the 10th, I have David Notowitz, who is a videographer for attorneys. Just, he does certain forensic videos, but he's going to talk about how to market to attorneys. And then I have Rallis Dana coming on on the 17th. He's a attorney, probate attorney in Arizona and California to talk about how he markets as well. So glad to talk about that anytime, um, Lisa. But it's a big topic. You know, it's not, it's not a question and answer. It's a half hour, 40 minute program. Glad to talk about your time. And Lisa, you can call me directly. We can talk about your particular questions because um, it does get a little personal on where you are in the marketplace and what value you're creating for clients. I find, and just to give a quick answer um, to Lisa's question, I find it much more challenging than you'd imagine. I believe referrals are hard to get in general. It takes a lot of work. Attorneys even more so. One problem with attorneys is they're not salespeople or they don't think they are. So they don't appreciate salesmanship. So you can't be, come across as a salesperson. You have to become an indispensable tool for them or be a source of business for them or uh, referrals for them. So I don't recommend, I know there are companies that sell you data and they'll tell you to cold call attorneys. I know one agent who says he built his business doing that, one, uh, one real estate agent, he's done really well, but frankly, he would do well doing anything. I know another one who says that's what he did, but that's not really what he did. He had property that he inherited in trust and met attorneys through that initially and then built on that for relationships with more attorneys and then later called a lot of attorneys. So I don't recommend cold calling attorneys. I do recommend though when we go back to this week was about brand new agents. If you're an experienced agent, I do recommend calling through your whole database. And we've talked about this before, identifying those clients that have an estate plan, those that don't and those that do asking who the attorney was that did it, asking them how they feel about them and if they love them, asking them if it's okay to call them to refer other clients to them. And then you call the attorney and it's the same process I just told you. You can calling to introduce them, not to ask for referrals, but to ask if you can refer them business. And again, we can talk in detail about that, but that's a whole different class uh, that we wouldn't have a time to finish on today. Hope that helps a little bit, Lisa. Um, Isaac asks, is it advisable to list property that the attorney is in the process of securing administrative authority? No appraisal has been done yet. The attorney is advising client to go ahead and list the property, even though the court's not approved her petition to uh, the administrator of the estate. So I actually just talked about that with an attorney who's in Arizona and California. And um, I took the class that Paul Horn does for California Association of Realtors, where he, you know, you get certified by CAR 
on his class. And he is the most prolific probate attorney in LA County by number of cases. He's may not be the nicest guy in the world if you're competing with him, but he definitely is a, a, a good businessman, a great probate attorney, knowledgeable. And he advises yes, and the attorney I talked to today advised yes, that you should list the property, but put in the disclosure that they acknowledge, that both parties acknowledge that the contract's not binding and can be canceled any time because technically the person signing the contract is empowered to create a contract, meaning mom dies, son is, you know, is applying for probate letters of administration. Until his letters are approved, he doesn't have the authority to bind the contract. It's mom's house, not his. And technically, up until the day he gets letters and re-signs the contract, he can say, never mind, I want to use somebody else. So as long as you know that, I think it's the right thing to do because it gives you a chance to earn your client's trust. I'm fine working hard for clients before I have a contract, but you have to make that decision on your own, number one. Number two, what your broker says, your broker allow you to do that or not. Because some companies do allow you and some companies don't. But I would say definitely, uh, personally, I would do it in a heartbeat. I've done it numerous times. Now I can't, I can't, use it to my client's disadvantage, I can only use it to their advantage. So for example, I can work with vendors, I can call the mortgage company, and they'll see the listing agreement. And they oftentimes will allow me to, to communicate with them in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. So uh, I hope that helps. Uh, Jasmine, you're the man. I am. Thank you. That's really nice. Um, great. Well, I think I, Jasmine, I'd like to see you be the ultimate. Uh, you know, it's so funny, because a lot of real estate agents don't want to call their clients because they don't think they have the superstar vendor list. And I would say, be the superstar vendor list. I was on a phone call with my coach, Chad Corbett, this week. And he asked a great question. There was a brand new agent. He said, well, I'm uncomfortable. I don't really have a good vendor list. I don't really know all the people. He said, if there was a check on the table for $25,000, your commission check, and what you had to do was get a great house painter, get the house painted, and get a great handyman and fix all things that'd be fixed. Could you do that for $30,000 more or $25,000 more? And she said, yes. He said, well, great. Then you are a great asset to your client. You are the superstar vendor list. And I, and I record a video um, that's going to come out where I talk about the be, do, have. This is a Tony Robbins concept. We think once we have the vendor list, then we'll be confident and then we'll make a lot of sales. It doesn't work that way in life. You first have to be the superstar, you have to be committed. Then you do what you're supposed to do, then you have the results. So I definitely urge you, Jasmine, be the superstar agent you want to be and you'll do what you have to do and it'll all work out. Um, Christopher asks, can an agent list a home if the seller is in testate estate? Intestate means there's no will. The probate case has been filed, but the letters have not been issued. So Christopher, same, same answer as before. If the letters aren't issued, technically, the person who owns the house is dead. Nobody, whether it's a will or not, has authority to write a binding contract on an estate until the court has authorized somebody to do that. That said, if there's a client of yours that you trust and you have a relationship with them, in my current case, I have an attorney who you know, had a deal. Yes, I'll step in and I will do all the things I need to do to help the client, even though technically that listing contract can be violated. We don't put in the MLS until they have letters, or if we do, we put in the MLS the fact that we don't have the letters, which basically to a smart agent means you could sign the listing contract and you're not really violating the MLS rules. So I would say just use that judiciously, uh, Christopher, but definitely you can. The question is, should you and when should you? Um, can't you legally sign subject to? Well, again, on the listing contract, you have to disclose it's not legally binding. And the attorneys I talk to say that you need to get the contract re-signed. So writing it subject to would mean that once they have letters, it's automatically enforced. That's not really going to work in this case. You really need to use some other mechanism to get them to um, be bound if you want to. I don't think there's a way you can really legally bind them. Um, well, I touch on the PR and full authority. I'm not sure what your question is, Rochelle. Um, a PR is a personal representative. Um, the person who files the probate to become the personal representative, either the executor or administrator, depending on if there's a will or not. 
Bill? Yeah. Yes. I have a question. I'm sorry. Um, so regarding the subject too, do you, it's Lisa, do you recommend, I, I, you heard, I heard something and, and I just wanted to make sure I heard it correctly. So I've been doing subject two and, but I have not been going back after they received their letters and doing a modification of terms. Do you recommend a modification of terms, you know, just, or a whole new, okay. A whole new list because the person signed the contract is is a different person the person signed the contract is joe smith yep the person now signed the contract is joe smith personal representative for mary smith's estate okay so yeah i would uh and attorneys i've talked to and and uh i can't remember lisa if you're with the xp or not but our broker yeah. state uh our state broker re requires us to resign the whole contract got it thank you yeah so we can't do it subject to meaning once they get the letters it's automatic and force we're not that doesn't really exist in this in this field of law because the person signing it really is empowered at the time and and they really are not empowered they're empowered to sign on behalf of the state not on behalf of themselves um okay PRs, how i do it uh, signing a uh, listing on tuesday for a pr who have been helping for the last few months great and i think the operative word there peter is that you've been helping so I'm, i should read out loud the question i guess sorry i got excited so peter says that's how i do it bill agreeing with me my favorite things when people agree with me that's everybody. He said he's signing a listing on Tuesday for a personal representative who have been helping for the last three months. Great. And I think the key phrase is, are you been helping them for three months? Like, how can another agent compete with that if you do your job properly? Right? So, great. Okay. Those are questions I have in queue. What else do I have? Any other? Let's see, chat. No. And if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook Live, you're welcome to type in the chat box, and I pick up questions there, but I don't see any as of right now. So you any know, other I questions? I have a question. Sure, who's I that? Have a question. Elizabeth. Hey, Elizabeth. So um, let's say um, I've been in the business for quite a while, but always representing and probates the buyers. This time, I have a seller. Seller has already the letter from the court. Uh, um, he's been approved. And now, question, can seller, once we list the property, can seller purchase a new property out of the proceed, um, from proceeds from this probate selling? I don't know if that makes sense. So I think your question is, mom and dad die, son inherits a property. Yes. Can, can son take the money and buy something else? Yes. The answer is yes, it's his money he, at the end of probate. So the thing is, they don't get distributed the money until the end of probate. So they, they can't do anything until the last thing that happens. Everybody gets paid before the heirs. It's really funny. The probate's really, the code's really written to protect the state first. Taxes get paid. Creditors next, or maybe attorneys. I don't know the exact order. Attorneys are in there somewhere. And then money left over goes, gets distributed to the state, to the heirs, I mean. So he's not going to get paid to the very end to buy another property. But yeah, at the end, he gets a check or whatever for his money. And one of the benefits should be, I think as a real estate agent, we should be talking to our clients who come into cash like that. Hey, let's take that money. Rather than keep this house just because your parents owned it, it's not suitable as a rental. We could turn it into a rental by buying this other alternative. Now, personally, I'm investing in real estate in some multifamily properties, and I can show them I put $50,000 here. I put $100,000 here. Here's the return I'm getting. Be glad to get you the same. It's not my program. We help you with that. Or you can help them buy another house. Sometimes the property that is in probate is not a great rental property uh, or require a lot of money to fix up. And not, you know, if you're not really a contractor and really experienced, unless it's money you don't worry about, I don't think your first investment should be fixing up a property to rehab just because it was your parents. Now, if sentimentally you want to hold it, great. That's a prerogative. But to answer your question, one of the one of the features you should have is what to do with the money. Another one is a wealth advisor. You know, I have a client who's cashing out his house and moving to Florida. And he's gonna have an extra five hundred thousand dollars cash. And so I introduced him to a wealth advisement, a wealth management company, a company that's in the business of saying, okay, how much do you have? What what are you doing with it? And here's a proposal for how you can both get a great return and minimize your risk. So that's just another vendor list. You could make a living, Elizabeth. Here's another interesting point. 
when you talk about helping somebody um, buy another property, which is your question, um, you're building more business because if you connect up with somebody who has good investments, now they come across a property where there's a trust or a probate, who are they going to call to list the property? You, right? Same with wealth advisors. When they have clients who need to sell property, who are they going to call? You, if you're, advising, if you're recommending the property to them. So every vendor we have is also an opportunity for referrals back to us if we do a job properly. Does that help? And yes, and I'm sorry, I totally missed the, uh, who's this vendor that you say that we can refer them? Is an investor, you said? Oh, a wealth, wealth management company. So turns out my son-in-law runs a tax department for a wealth advisory company in Santa Monica called Gerber Kawasaki. Gerber Kawasaki is a, uh, Ross Gerber is on CNN all the time. And he's one of those guys who talks about stocks going up and down. And one of my daughter's friends is like one of the top salespeople. She's a wealth advisor at Gerber Kawasaki. And I literally just moved in, a, you know, a lot of my savings, a lot of cash to them as well personally. And I really like the way they do business. Um, interestingly enough, they also use trustandwills.com, one of the vendors I had on this program a few months ago for their clients. So we're kind of in the same world and I'd love to be their real estate resource. And I think you should always, when you refer to somebody, try to be that person. But um, if you like, if you want to email me or text me privately, uh, if you have questions for wealth management, I'd be glad to introduce you to the rep because it's not just the company. Of course, you can go on the website and, and pick it out, but it's really the individual representative that you want to develop a relationship with. Yes, I would love to do that. I will yeah. email you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, good. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, okay, what kind of returns am I receiving on your in, uh, multifamily investment? Well, I, since I just recently uh, invested quite a bit, um, I'd say, you know, uh, uh, it's always subject to change to get it in your pocket. But what I'll say is um, I'm not necessarily investing for short term, but for longer term and tax. There's certain types of investments where when they buy the property and they rehab it, you get tax advantages that year. So in December, I got a nice tax deduction as well as uh, about 5% return on my money per year. And then the idea is they rehab the property, they rent it back up, raise the rents, and then either refinance or sell it, and there's another distribution at the end. So hopefully I'm getting 5% per year, cash on cash in the early years. And I should average 21% over the 10-year life of the investment. That's kind of the average I'm looking for on my investments currently. But I do like ones where I get a tax, in, uh, tax incentive in the calendar year as well, because that's worth money to me, because I've, I've had a couple of really good years and I need to minimize my tax um, liabilities when I can. Um, uh, Cloud Capital LLC is one of the companies I invested with. Cardone Capital is another one I invested with recently. Um, yeah, but look them up. If, if Cloud Capital LLC, I think, um, if you're interested, or text me or email me and I'll send you the info. Veronica Jones, what's the best way to leave a property in a trust for taxes? Veronica, that's a a complicated question for a tax attorney, um, and it depends on your the particular estate, what kind, what what you have, what you're trying to protect, who you're trying to protect it for. So I would always recommend if you have something out of the ordinary um, to talk to a professional. In general, and I, and I had some attorneys agree with the statement: ninety percent of people are better to have a estate plan with a living trust than nothing. Ninety percent. So at least get something done. You can always redo an estate plan and make it more personal, make it more structured for taxes and, and depending on your situation. But maybe you know, when the, you have mixed families with prior marriages and stepkids and some are you know, uh, younger and some are into drugs and there's a business involved, they get complicated. That's why some estate plans cost 10, 20, $50,000 or more. In general, I use trustandwills.com as a vendor service. I can give you a link for a discount if you're interested in that as a basic plan. To get started with it, you can always go to an attorney and get it updated and get something more comp more customized. Okay, other questions? We're kind of wrapping up here at the end, but uh, I love the interaction. I always wanted to be uh, that you guys get information. Was this interesting, helpful as far as helping with brand new agents? Um, was it Bill, a benefit? Sorry, I have another question. This is Elizabeth yeah. um, again. Uh, I heard about the 90 day period. Um, time frame when the 90 days to start or when they're um where they reach when they're okay after the 90 days that's when they need to sell doesn't they need to be okay with i don't know 90 I'm days for lost. what um they 
being told, seller being told that it has to pass 90 days from when the probate starts what? in order for him to sell or get proceeds. Well, in general, that means the attorney is not doing his job because by definition in, in LA, well, I guess it varies at times. There have been times that the court was, and that's also, it depends on when they filed, because there was a time with COVID that the initial hearing, which is supposed to be 30 days out, um, the, it, there was a time when that initial hearing was, because of COVID restrictions, their backlog was 90 days out. But we went back to 30 days recently. But there's holidays. I haven't, I, I, to be honest, I haven't looked lately. But in general, the filing date, and I'll look it up while we're talking, just to I'll give you an up-to-date uh, status. But in general, when you file the probate, you immediately get a court date for what's called your initial hearings. Your initial hearing is theoretically, if you file your paperwork correctly, here we go, date, file date, initial hearing, where are they? Um, I'm just jumping on the, under my database here real fast to check. Okay, so here's filings January 26th, and they're getting initial hearing dates of uh, March 2nd. So that's 37 days, right? So theoretically, if you file the paper properly, when you file and you do the work between now and then, you publicize and you notice the parties are required to be noticed and you file the will and do things you're supposed to do, theoretically, not only is it approved on March 2nd, it's reviewed and approved before March 2nd, recommended for approval. So unless somebody comes in and objects, it's automatically approved. You even have to go for the hearing. You'll say recommended for approval, and then you just check that nobody complains, and then the next day it's approved. The reason why it's, see, people uh, turn to say 90 days, there was a time it was taking 90 days because of COVID and maybe because of the holidays. But generally speaking, it's because the attorney doesn't fill the paper properly, and it gets rejected or continued one or two times. So their experience is it's 90 days. Now there's another, I should say, there's another thing that has to happen is they get approved on March 2nd, and then the attorney has to prepare the order, get signed by the judge, and you have to get the original copy. So the smart attorneys file that uh, uh, the day of the hearing, and it gets signed within a few days, and you get a copy of it. So it's maybe 40 days, 50 days at the most. But they'll say 90 because Generally, most cases, I can just I can tell you the statistics, most of them are get continued one, two, or three times because the paperwork's not done properly and it delays out the process. Now, once you have the letters, you have to file a notice of proposed action, which would be the sale, and, and wait 15 days for that. So I guess, you know, if, if you if it takes 10 days to get the letter, that's 40 days, and you have your notice of proposed action be 55 days. It wouldn't be 90 days though, unless there's some delay. Um, it could be the attorney saying you don't sign the listing agreement until you get the letters and then in market time, two weeks and then three day escrow, maybe that's where you came for 90 days. So I don't know, but theoretically, if you listed it before the appointment hearing with a condition that's not bindable, you get a contract and you tell the buyer subject to getting the letters approved, you can be closing in three days after you get the letters, 60 days total. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah. The only time 90 days applies with RP, I don't know what that means, uh, Gunnar. There's a 90 day limit on the listing agreement. A listing agreement, a appropriate listing agreement can only be done for 90 days at a time. So you can extend it every 90 days, but the initial can't mean a performance from the opening of the probate. Yeah, it depends. I guess I guess it could take 90 days. You know, if you if you want to say that from the opening to the closing of the escrow, that could take 90 days, I guess, if you have listing time period in escrow. Okay. Thanks. Hey, we're past the hour. We're going a little over time here. I'm sorry to go late to you guys. Um, but I want to say this. If you like this, um, uh, we, sit, we uh, do this every week, Thursday, 4 p.m., probateweekly.com. We send out as well every week a reminder, but there's also a link to the replay if you miss it. And if you watch on YouTube and hit the like button, I appreciate it. If you hit subscribe and the notifications, you'll get a notice every time we go live, and you can watch on YouTube as well. Uh, if you register with Eventbrite, though, you can come in to the Zoom in person and ask questions in person, which I'm, I'm glad I enjoy that. I think it makes it more fun to be here in person. So every Thursday, 4 o'clock, probateweekly.com, Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time, 
or watch it on YouTube, Bill Gross EXP. Thank you, everybody who participated. I really appreciate it.